and Mark, I'd like to hand things over to our executive director, Steve Hummerkaus, for a brief message. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this last of our five-part series on the effects of COVID on our nation and our world. As Ben said, I'm Steve Hummerkaus, executive director of the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I'm really excited to have you join us. <clears throat> and as you can see, as all of us are uh, likely, coming, I'm coming to you from my home in North Minneapolis. <clears throat> the original Diversity Insights Breakfast were paid events, uh, but for these virtual presentations, we replaced the registration fee with a suggested donation of $30. I want to thank all of you who have said that you would donate to help support the work of the forum. All of our work is paid for by registration fees and corporate sponsorships. By waiving registration fees, we're relying on your donations to sustain our mission of engaging people, advancing ideas, and igniting change. It's not too late to donate towards today's presentation. You can find the donate button on our website at forum workplace inclusion slash donate. Now on to today's diversity insights presentation. In last month's presentation, we learned about the need for a racially equitable recovery from COVID-19 and the factors that will lead to that recovery. This month, we'll explore how we as global citizens should respond to the triple pandemics of COVID-19, economic collapse, and racial inequity. What do we need to know? What do we need to do in response to this triple threat and the rise of nationalism and the closing of borders and the risk to global commerce and community that these threats are bringing about? Our three presenters are experts in this space. So we'll hear from Mark, Shantara, and Khadija this morning. Mark will open our presentation today, followed by Shantara and Khadija. All three of them will speak to key questions concerning global citizenship, some supplied by our audience members in advance of today's webinar. A key, and a key component of today's presentation is your questions. So please type them into the Q&A section as they come to you, and we will then respond to them after uh, Khadija, Mark, and, and Shantara speak. And now, please let me welcome Mark Ritchie. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Ben, for pulling us together. We started this process of stepping towards today's seminar quite a few months ago. And we had in mind that in this world, as it's currently structured and all of the things that were going on six months ago, that the notion of global being global-minded thinking about the whole planet, thinking about others as they affect our own life here in our community, but thinking about the things that we do that affect others around the planet. This was our, our kind of central focus. And in my role as president of Global Minnesota, it's uh, an opportunity I have every single day, our mission connecting Minnesotans to the world and the world to Minnesota, uh, really puts that uh, in front of me every day. But it also reflects just my own core values. I had the very good fortune of growing up where uh, thinking about the world was uh, on the mind of enough people around me, and I was interested in what they were thinking and saying. My father came home from the Second World War, having uh, been a China Marine, served in China in the Marine Corps uh, in the occupation and after the war. Um, and uh, he came home having uh, seen hunger and starvation and death in front of his eyes, brought home pictures, and decided to devote his life to seeing what he could do about world hunger, and became a scientist and devoted himself to making sure people could uh, keep their food animals safe, but it was just in the conversation. But that whole notion that what we do impacts others in the world and what is happening around the world impacts our lives is uh, the kind of central thing that motivates me and what I think about day in and day out. And I'm thrilled that we have this opportunity to talk about that this morning among ourselves, but also to hear the insights and the questions from all of this audience that's scattered around the world. And I just uh, am grateful that the moment we live in, the global pandemic has really created an opening for talking about and deepening our understanding of how we are truly globally connected. And I'm hopeful that in conscious action, we can take advantage of that awareness, that interest, uh, that uh, conversation to then make the world a better place on the other side for everybody 
That means to tackling white supremacy and racial injustice. That means tackling gender inequality. That means thinking about uh, people whose lives are turned upside down by climate and other big, massive changes. But it also means how we handle ourselves in our own lives, in our workplace, in our families, in our communities, and around the world. Um, we've been given a chance for a broader, bigger, deeper conversation. And this morning, from my perspective, is a way that we can take advantage of that opportunity. Thank you again, Stephen and Ben, for this opportunity. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you so much all to all the participants who are joining us today. It's an honor to be here with you all. And I wanna thank Mark for the wonderful opening, as well as Shantara for joining us this morning to talk about this um, wonderful conversation of global citizenship. And thank you to Steve and all the team um, that have helped put this together. My name is Khadija Ali. I am an entrepreneur, um, I'm a mom of two beautiful girls, and I live in Minnesota. I run a company called Global Language Connections that provide language services, uh, both in interpretation and translation, both locally and globally. And um, we provide over 200 languages. And as you can imagine, this pandemic had a huge impact on our business, and as, you, and as well as personally. Um, so, but, you know, I want to take a step back and to let you guys know a little bit about myself and how I came to this country. My life actually began in, on the opposite side of the world. Uh, I was born in East Africa in a country called Somalia and a city called Mogadishu. And uh, due to civil war, my family and I were displaced when I was eight years old. And, um, and I've lived in a refugee camp for about six years prior to immigrating to America. Um, and I, I, I like to call myself as a self-appointed global citizen ambassador uh, because of a personal experience. I believe that this was, a, this was destined for me. And I say that global citizenship chose me because of my personal experience and how I was able to benefit the hard work and the belief and the goodness of, 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 of humanity. I'm here today talking to you from Minnesota because of the goodness of people who really took the time to understand the need for a refugee to, to relocate to the United States. Uh, with that said, you know, this is a very tough time. We we're going through something that I've never been seen in the world. And I can tell you as a Somali and a Muslim American, we've seen a lot of um, black swan black events in the past. We've seen, um, but we've never seen anything like this that really truly unified all of us. I remember when I only heard the rumblings about the fires spreading in China. I remember just hearing um, stories about this foreign illness that was happening in China. And I remember, you know, feeling so surreal that, and then again, fast forward within a month, I, everything we talked about or everything we were doing or all of our lives have shifted because of this foreign somehow illness that came to the world that was unknown to all of us. And I just remember that, you know, I couldn't imagine um, experiencing this type of pandemic um, back in March, you know, I couldn't imagine the world experiencing this type of pandemic, let alone personally going through this um, illness myself. So I can tell you that, you know, this obviously, um, this has really shifted how we live our lives. And I run a company that is doing work around the world. And our business is communication. It's communicating uh, and bringing communities together around the world. So as a global citizen, I remember just you know, talking to uh, my state um, representatives and just my local government saying, 
well, we do have a large communities here who don't understand what's going on and what's happening. How can we make sure that they are not having community spread and just having like a normal conversation, not really thinking about the magnitude of this illness and the magnitude and the impact of this pandemic. But all of a sudden it has shifted all, you know, how we all live, uh, both locally and globally. And it has shifted how we operate our business. And the majority of my business was in-person interaction and where we've done a lot of our work face to face, which within weeks entirely became remote and, and online, blank, online platforms. So for me, I will, I, will, I will stop here, but then we can go back to having more questions. But um, this pandemic has truly shifted how we live and work, but at the same time, coming from an immigrant community, I felt like we had more responsibility to not only engage a local community, but then global ones, because everything has a ripple effect. And we had a personal responsibility to really take care of our local community first and then engage our global ones. So thank you so much. Good morning and thank you, Khadija. Um, it is a, just an honor to join you all on this platform. I appreciate any time I get a chance to hang out with Khadija and, and Mark and they're just amazing minds and, the, and just the impactful work that they have done locally, but also globally. I too want to thank um, Steve and the Osberg team just for their tremendous commitment to making the opportunity available for us today, but also just their commitment to global work. Osberg has been a leader in making sure that not only their students, but the communities around them are able to be a part of this world and have a footprint that not only brings opportunity to communities outside their door, but communities around the world. So I really appreciate being able to um, be a part of this discussion today. So again, my name is Shantara Hardy. I am a public policy professional and a serial, uh, serial entrepreneur. I own a number of companies that work at the intersection of public policy, placemaking, and prosperity. My North Star is focusing on how do I do my part to build inclusive economies that lead to high quality um, of life for individuals and communities, both locally and internationally. My strategy firm is called Policy Grounds Consulting. My civic tech company that I co-founded with three other individuals is called Civic Eagle. And we build legislative intelligence tools um, here in the United States to help advocacy groups to Fortune 500, to um, nonprofits and other NGOs track legislative policy in all 50 states in Congress. And then my third company is Fearless Commerce, which focuses on elevating Black women-owned businesses through coffee table books, publishing um, a number of volumes already to live events focused on building business fundamentals. I tell you about that work because that work speaks to my commitment to not only making sure that opportunities exist for businesses here in Minnesota, but I know that when it comes to truly being able to scale, you gotta go outside of your door. And when you think about global citizenship and you think about um, what comes with, with that work, I think about the time we end for such a time as this, and someone in the chat mentioned, um, we are having this conversation as one of, one of the greatest civil rights leaders lay at rest, uh, Mr. John Lewis. And when you think about his work and when, it, when you truly unpack global citizenship, it's core around making authentic connections understanding the narratives and the neurons of people that may be different from you and leading through the commitment to collaboration with a strong sense of compassion. And that's something that he did. And no matter who he talked to, he was unwavering in his commitment to see the goodness 
even when he got in good trouble, to make sure that whoever was sitting at the table, that their outcomes will become better. And so I look forward to, to having this conversation, to bringing my public policy background, my work um, formerly as the state commissioner here in Minnesota, where I had responsibility for the state of Minnesota over um, international trade and making sure that companies that wanted to do business with Minnesota and Minnesota companies had access to the world. And so I look forward to um, having the conversation. Well, we were fortunate to get some questions from people even before today, but one of them that uh, is just seems like the perfect follow up for uh, our opening was a question about how somebody who's successful here can think about and make a plan and execute that plan to become global in their business or professional life. Uh, Shantara, you had that as a sort of responsibility in our state government. Khadija, you've been doing that and making that happen. Uh, maybe the two of you could uh, uh, help the questioner, and I think lots of folks on the call have this question. Uh, how can they uh, take that part of their life out into the broader uh, global marketplace? Absolutely. Um, you want me to start, Khadija, or you okay. start? All right. Um, so my, my experience is coming from being um, on the regulatory side of helping businesses in Minnesota um, navigate the, the global footprint. When you think about um, the opportunity to scale and do it in a way, I think the core um, thing around that process is, is taking the authentic path. And for me, I think there are very specific things that you need to understand when you're going into a different community is understanding um, not only the policy and political environment, but also the cultural environment. And when you make that decision to expand, it's launching with a true um, plan that leads with a clear understanding of the economies. You know, what is your why? Do you have a true understanding of the needs of your potential customers, making sure that you do the work around having a deep understanding of the demographics and preferences and just the behavior that happens in that community because you can't just cut and paste um, your product from your community, especially if you truly did the work of, from my perspective, of building a, a conscious company that your product and services should be rooted in empathy and those that customer that you're trying to serve. And so making sure you understand that business environment, the geography, the culture, understanding the risk that comes with that. And the last thing I'll say related to kind of the business of the business, having a strategic plan that allows for you to have a strong back office with you and making sure that you have the right partners in banking and legal and tax and those experts that will help you to navigate kind of those processes because when you think about going into another community you want to make sure that you understand the rules of engagement and you want to make sure that that is not just from a policy and political perspective but that's from a community and cultural perspective and authenticity respect and true understanding is core to, I believe, um, companies that have been successful with expanding in other communities were really able to do that. And that is, is essential to um, making sure that your product or service can be successful. And I just want to piggyback one Shantara. I mean, Shantara said everything, actually. Thank you so much. This was, uh, you know, my experience in this is from the language aspect. Uh, we have worked with companies for the past decade. And um, I think one thing that companies don't really take the time to understand, and I think this time, while we're going through this uh, very surreal time and the pandemic, I think, it's, I think now is the perfect time to do your research about the market you wanna enter into. Learn about the culture. 
and the policies and the government and everything else Shantara have mentioned and um, also making sure to get local partners to help you build the trust. Um, a lot of the companies that we have seen have really gained a lot of success in the global market, have truly been, in, it was intentional. They took the time to build the relationships. They took the time to understand the culture and the community, and also uh, making sure that um, you are surrounding yourself with people who really truly understand the local market. Just Shantara said, you can cut and paste. Maybe you had a success in one country that might not transfer to another country. It might not even transfer to another city within that country. So making sure you understand the local constituents and, and local and, and getting that local partner is, is being crucial to a lot of our clients' success. And um, yeah, and I think just this is, I believe this is a time to reflect and pause and build those relationships. Thank you. Shantara, I, I seem to recall that a trip that you finally took overseas was pretty transformative in changing how you think about some of these global and professional matters. Uh, any insights to people watching, uh, things that they might uh, find just transformative in how they think about becoming more global? Absolutely. Um, you're referring to uh, our trip very early in my professional career when I got to go to Zambia and uh, build houses with the Habitat um, International. And I got to do that with a very unique um, group, um, one that I don't think during that time Habitat International had experience and it was a um, group of um, black and brown women with professional backgrounds as architects, planners, and designers. And we put our own group together and made the commitment to go and build in Zambia. And there were a couple things that um, went along with this trip. We, first of all, we owned our, our schedule and agenda and made sure that we weren't just gonna just come and just build this house and not understand the condition, but not connect as especially the black woman on, on the trip to understand the cultural significance of being able to um, be in Africa. And, and for me, it was transformative as a professional. I, I think I told you um, the story of, of getting off of the transportation, all 11 of us, and it was a standstill of um, looking at us because that village had never seen that many professional black and brown women coming in the, to their community without any other cultures with us. And so that was transformative for them too, to, to know and see a vision of possibility that um, individuals that look like them have the ability and the commitment to come and, and, and build community with them. And so it was, it was very life-changing for me because there was an assumption of an, that landing in Africa of immediate embrace and understanding of that connection and, and relationship. And it was one that had to be built. And we, you know, went beyond building houses, um, you know, made it our business to meet with the First Lady of Zambia made it our business to meet with the Minister of Lands to get an understanding of policy. And that for me was, was extremely transformative. I know we're in this environment of um, you know, physical distancing, which I believe is, is important to truly um, knowing someone. You know, you can know of someone. But being able to be in the presence and, and be able to connect, to understand, and to learn in someone else's house, in someone else's space, is truly powerful. And for me, um, since that trip and the opportunity as commissioner to pretty much go all, all around the world to represent Minnesota, being able to not only bring the knowledge and the, and the narratives from, from Minnesota, but also to be able to bring back very profound 
um, learning and experiences to do what I call is, is R and D, you know, rip off and deploy. So, you know, some great ideas to land them in Minnesota. And that's what you get when you have a global mindset that, you know, you operate in this space that you're no better than, especially if you haven't taken the time to understand and appreciate because we always can learn, even if we've been doing the experience for a hundred years. And so that for me, just really kicked off, um, you know, a conversation that we had, a word that still um, is swirling inside of me is that when you think about um, visiting other places and when you think about having tough conversations, that curiosity should be core to those conversations because that opens you up to wanting to learn more and wanting to just go deeper because that curiosity becomes core to being able to walk away with something greater. Khadija, we're on the eve of a very, very important religious holiday, but all over the planet, people are often, uh, their faith is really central in the United States and everywhere on the planet. Uh, what's the advice and uh, tips for the questioner about uh, how somebody who's really settled and firmly but successfully here can really enter that global market and but also the global community the global society you know i i really agree everything shantara said because the thing is i think thank you for this it's a great question as i was mentioning earlier actually today is one of the most important days in the islamic calendar it's called arafah and a lot of Muslims around the world that are actually fasting and, and, and praying um, as we speak. So, um, and the thing is, I honestly think global mindset starts locally. You have mm. to be, it starts with our neighbors. It starts with our friends. It starts with those that are different from us. Taking the time to reflect and understand who they are. Um, and, and just, you know, as I think, we have seen uh, what transcend after George Floyd's murder in Minnesota, right? Um, how the communities have come together. So I do believe global mindset status locally because when we do the work locally, then we're only able to take globally. I believe that right now in Minnesota, we, have, we speak over 200 languages. One of our clients had 196 languages spoken at their healthcare facility last year, just locally. So we live in a global world locally. So I believe that taking the time to understand people and taking the time to understand the needs without, without all the bias, without all the prejudice we have inside of us. We all do have prejudice inside of us. We all have bias inside of us about certain people. So taking the time to understand the need of your neighbors, I believe that's where global mindset starts. And um, you know, one thing we we did in our company is that when the global pandemic started and everything started shifting, all of our work shifted to an online platform. All of a sudden, we are translating documents in a real time for global clients. And what we realize is the communication they were trying to use for the local community. Or, 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 or the people in the United States needed to be different to those communication and awareness and the education they were creating those in refugee camps. So for us, we took the time to pause, even though we were really extremely busy, um, to say, we need to help you and guide you and to let you know that you're wasting your money and time if you just release this as they are into your global markets. So sometimes taking the time to understand the need of those you're serving is the most is the key to global citizenship and global mindset well there's several questions um that well let me use the language of the questioners uh, it seems somebody asked it seems to me that a lot of recent there's a lot of recent pushback against immigrants and global initiatives that maybe this has to do with lack of access or understanding of the lives that are in the global community, personal contacts. 
uh, and then related, our country seems to be of two opposing minds about America's role in the global community. Do you have thoughts, suggestions for how to engage our fellow citizens who believe strongly that the U.S. should withdraw from global engagement? Thoughts? Advice? I have a lot of thoughts. Where should I begin? Uh, Take it away. My thing is, I, I don't want to get political, so these questions have, might have some... Uh, but one thing I'll tell you, I immigrated to this country about 20 years ago with my family. And I believe the beauty in America really lies with that immigration um, community. We bring so much culture, so much joy, and so much richness into our local communities. But with that said, I believe it will be a miss for the U.S. to withdraw a lot of their global engagement. Um, we have a responsibility as a country. We, are, we have a responsibility to our mankind to not only engage, but to really fully participate in global um, perspectives and global ideas and, 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 and contribute to, to, to create a better world. The thing is, COVID-19 started in Wuhan, China. For a moment, none of us could even phantom the idea of contracting that locally in Minnesota. It was a foreign illness. But this truly shows you that how borderless we are, how much we need to be on, um, how much that we need to work together and to collaborate. Um, we need our governments around the world to collaborate. And U.S. is not an exception. We actually, U.S. is a country that's based on immigration, that was built on immigration, that has a responsibility from the founding fathers to continue with the tradition and the, and, and the principles it was founded upon. Shantira. I too have lots of thoughts. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer, you know, through, through my lens of, um, business, you know, when you think about the product and services that we all enjoy here in the United States, as, as, um, commissioner, I learned that, um, a number of products from our fortune 500 companies, such as Cargill or, um, General Mills cross the border simply to Canada six or seven times before they're complete. We are connected. And from a standpoint of conscious and unconscious decisions, we made the decision to move forward with connecting to the rest of the world. When we think about um, who is leading um, these large companies and many small companies. I think the number a number of years ago for the number of um, Fortune 500 companies either founded by an immigrant or a child of immigrant was over 43 percent. So when we think about who the United States is, when we think about who is representing the United States, our, through our blood, we have a community, as Khadija said, that on the ground locally is already um, full of many different cultures and understanding. And it's my belief that, you know, this whole mindset of um, wanting to isolate the United States of America, as we we, we, we're seeing it right now. We, we saw it in March with respect to having to scramble to get PPE. We have seen it when it comes to, you know, truly understanding our neighbors because there's, a, there's this awareness, there's this either lack of, of education um, and this, this individualism. And I think that's something that is we've seen right now that individual decisions can have devastating impacts on just individual fam, just a family in and of itself. Your individual decision to only think about yourself 
is having devastating impacts. And I, I just think that um, um, the opportunity to hear and have the courage to hear and connect to people that don't look like you actually makes you better. You know, like if you wanted to determine that because the candle was just better and you never wanted to venture to the light bulb, like you go ahead and stay in the candle world. We're going to be over here innovating, you know, going, for, going all the way past LED. Like this whole, it's a small mindset to stay, be stuck in this space of individualism, stuck in this space of oneness. Um, and I, I just don't believe that you create and sustain um, communities and economies through this individualized. I mean, we, the world was created in a way that, that you have certain you know, minerals and, and other just precious um, uh, fuels and things that live in different parts. And we all need those things for different things. And if you don't have this connected uh, mindset, connected economies, then you have places as you do where you have communities that are starving, communities that don't have access to clean water. And to have the opportunity to be able to connect and contribute to the betterment you, you can't have a single-minded mindset. It just doesn't work. And in the end, that you lose. I mean, bartering was the core of our, you know, economic system. Give me what you got so that I can get what I need. Well, one thing I've been very uh, surprised about, but uh, in a way now that I think about it, it does seem some logic, uh, the Gallup, the big polling organization for 55 years has been asking the American public uh, in a huge national survey, should we have more immigration or less? And for 55 years, the American public has always said less until today. And Gallup was so taken by what kind of sea change has taken place uh, that they made a big deal and you know made public announcement and all of that. But I think it doesn't mean that we're not still divided. I think one of the question was about uh, you know how we're divided, but it does mean that the lived experience of people, uh, the COVID and other things and the recognition that we need to collaborate and cooperate in the scientific realm, in the medical realm, but having now more people believing that we should increase immigration, not decrease, does mean that we're in the middle of a, of a new thought process. And, and I think that can be said also about uh, issues of uh, racial discrimination. It also, um, in a way, thanks to the Me Too movement, has been uh, some sea change around uh, gender uh, uh, abuse and uh, inequality and uh, uh, you know just uh, outrageous behavior. We're we're in a, a time for change, and I think um, the very large audience for our discussion this morning, but also the just the um, poignancy of the questions and other things, leads me to want to know more from both. Uh, Khadija and you, Shantara, what are you seeing as the kind of places where our society is connecting directly with people in other places with uh, an intention of becoming um, more globally understanding, but also collaborating, um, cooperating, maybe partnering uh, what are those uh, s specifics that you're, uh, you know, stories that you're hearing or knowing yourself um, that can give our audience today some um, inspiration, but also some ideas about how they can use this time uh, to really accelerate that opportunity for themselves? I... Um... Thank you, Mark. I mean, the thing is, 
when the pandemic started, no one knew what to do. There was no contingency plan. No one had seen anything like this before. And at the same time, it really united all human beings. You were all afraid of the same thing, contracting this virus. Our fears might be different because of our different privileges we have, we have within our uh, different um, uh, you know, lives. But one thing I'll tell you, the immigrant community had put together a task force that not only were able to create resources and access to information for the local immigrant community, but they, they did not stop. They took the time. We had Minnesota doctors uh, were using their skills to help people in different countries. They were getting on calls. Uh, they were helping actually um, contribute to health care in, I, I'll tell you, in Somalia. Uh, we have different time zones. We have different, you know, um, ways of doing things. But they really took the time to use their skill sets to create, um, help create awareness and transform health care in other countries. Um, I'll tell you that one of the things we did here is the local communities, uh, when their businesses shut down, we were able to create resources for them to access the BBE, all the different all the different resources that were available with the local as well as the federal government, and and these are young professionals who don't have the time, but all of a sudden right now we're searching for something to do, and I'll tell you because we have a lot of people in America who do not speak English, we were able to help create educational materials in different languages and deliver them in a language in a, in a way that the elders in those communities could receive so that it helped prevent community spread. Um, I can tell you stories after a story. When the George Floyd murder um, took place, my office actually locates right on Lake Street where that took place, few blocks away from where that took place. And after the unrest uh, that followed the George Floyd's murder, we had a lot of people came all over Minnesota, uh, coming from Duluth, coming from Wilmer, to just come help us clean up. And we had young boys who we've never met before coming and, and, and putting um, you know, protections for our offices. We had young artists who were coming to write words of aspiration and inspiration and, 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 uh, and to our uh, streets. So we've seen a lot of unity and goodness come out of the, obviously the pandemic as well as the social justice issues that's going on in our country. And I believe that a lot of the young people do not stop locally. All of them are searching for um, ways to engage the, to the global community. And the doctors are one of them. We have business and lawyers also who were also guiding and educating entrepreneurs in other countries, helping them with resources. We've done different fundraising to support women-owned, uh, minority-owned businesses. Um, the thing is, when you, I believe, create access and create resources, particularly women, everyone benefits. That's just, you know, time, we have seen this time and time again in research. When you empower girls and women, you really do see that return in the community. So. Shantara. Oh, Khadija just, just really uplifted a number of different things. I, I want to just actually um, just hold space for the just the amazing aspirations and things that um, Khadija laid out. I also want to just go a little deeper on this moment that we're in. When you think about um, the pandemic and you think also about the, um, the, the racist uh, path that we are all walking on, it's, 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 it's this, we saw in our community for both an awakening and a reckoning. When you think about the pandemic, there was an awakening and a reckoning to injustices in the healthcare system. And the deep health disparities with respect to access, not only to testing, but access to 
um, professionals, access to just the actual location of a clinic to go to. So you saw this awakening and this reckoning because it became the situation where it wasn't an option to not make the investment in those communities that didn't have those resources because if those individuals became sick, there was the likelihood, and we're seeing it, that they go elsewhere and we spread the disease. So you saw that when you think about the awakening and reckoning after the murder of George Floyd, you saw the systemic ugliness of injustice in all of our systems come to bear. For Black Americans who for 401 years have been talking about the systemic injustices that have held back First and foremost, economic opportunity. Secondly, with respect to the discriminatory practices in all of these other industries, people woke up. Um, you saw here in Minnesota, uh, over 40 black women who said when on that video, they heard George Floyd cry out for their mother these 40 women are mothers and sisters and said he was calling for them to do their part, to stand up, to change the policies that were holding the black community back. And you saw them not think twice about not having a career in policy and politics that they were gonna go and be the change and the vision of possibility to make a difference. You saw all of that. And as we think about um, both of these crises, the one thing you saw from a global perspective, I never thought I would see in China and Japan signs that say Black Lives Matter. You saw a humanization of a community. You saw issues that people were for so long have been able to dehumanize because it wasn't touching them as Khadija said they had privileges. And so we're in this space now that until Black Lives Matter, all lives can't matter. So humanizing a community, humanizing generations of people that have existed, but have contributed to the beauty of this world through inventions, through the labor, through the ingenuity, but not being able to be humanized. And that for me has been inspiration in my space of business. Business is seeing themselves and seeing outside of their door, especially here in Minnesota, the block being burned, but then coming back inside and seeing their boardrooms being burned because they had to face the injustices in their hiring, in their who they do business with, and their lack of investment in community. And so you've seen that in the other space. And I'll end on this because it is inspiration in the policy space. You saw, you saw policy go from never to now. In all of my years of being a lobbyist of how quick we got to say paid family leave was important, how quick we got to say that we need to improve our unemployment systems, how quick we said people need to get coverage for healthcare, how quick we said we need to go to telehealth and that we can figure out privacy and dignity of care, but we got there real quick. And for some individuals who have labored their entire life to see humane policies pass, overnight they became the law of the land. And so for me, it's more inspiration and accountability and actually just saying it can be done because you just showed me <laughs> that it can be done. And so that for me should give people hope that the systems, because many of the things that we have to step back and think about are constructs. And we in our great minds as humans, we created them. If we created them, we can destroy them and build them up in a way that they can actually get the positive outcomes, not only for people that are in households, but be able to take that ingenuity and those changes in policies and processes to then go to be able to share 
those learnings with other parts of the world for the betterment of the world. So, I think it's been the case that that sudden awareness that we can do these things and in a time frame that's now is alongside of the notion that, oh, we don't have enough money for that is now up against apparently trillions and trillions uh, that we can just make happen. So we're talking about not just sort of, I would say quantitative change, we're talking qualitative change or system change. And a couple of our questions really have gotten to that. Um, one of them was how do we understand the interconnections between the inequities here and overseas, and, and you both have spoken to this in some ways, how does this play out in finding the new ways to build bridges and economies? How does the fact that now suddenly we're able to see and speak about those uh, connections, how does that guide us into some new ways of thinking about bridge building and economic connections? And the other question is, um, sort of how do we envision this as a matter of systems change? Not just, you know, bigger band-aids, but really does our new understanding of the globalness and the localness as it's linked give us some new tools or insights for real system change? Our, our friends are asking us hard questions and I'm thinking a little I bit go ahead, about- Go Khadija, I see Khadija, her brain- Yeah. You go Khadija, go ahead. You're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you. I, I wanted to, Chantal, to see if she wants to go first. She seemed to be making great points and, um, um, and I'm learning a lot. So, uh, well, I think, Leveraging technology will be one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. as right now, you know, we, I think this pandemic has truly unified us. We all have sort of a similar narrative uh, because of the pandemic. Um, we have the same fears. So I believe leveraging technology and, 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 and the unitedness that's coming from this pandemic I, I think this will help us um, live in a better world to sort of help eliminate, I'm, I'm hoping that this pandemic, I mean, obviously it will take us economically back, but I believe, I hope, I'm hoping that the, the technology platforms we've created, the connections that is so easily um, are happening across the globe will continue and we will be able to maximize these um, resources even more so going forward in the future. And um, so I think, yeah. So I, I think I'll end with just, you know, we're all able to move forward with business online. We, like, I will tell you my company, we were utilizing technology in the past, but the way we utilize technology right now, I believe we're learning something new every day. We're learning new way to utilize um, um, technology, and I think social media uh, has shown um, how it can take. Just, uh, I mean, I don't want to keep going back, but the murder of George Floyd in Minnesota across to across the globe. So I believe we have a new way of doing things. It might not be easy at the beginning but it's definitely, it might create more accessible and more equal uh, world if we really take the time to understand and, 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 and to invest into uh, those that need more to, to utilize technology and, and create access for everyone. Yeah, here, here as a technology founder. Yes, leverage <laughs> technology. I'll, I'll say from a systems perspective, just a simple method, and you can do, it starts in your home because you are part of the system. And how do you make sure first that you understand the system? Three simple things. What should you stop doing? What should you start doing and what should you continue? 
One of the things that I've learned with respect to our systems, be it education, healthcare, um, economic development, is that we're working on something, either it's working for a few or it's difficult and we're trying to figure it out or it's successful. There's never time that we evaluate it. We just go to the next shiny thing. And you just keep layer on top of layering and there's never this evaluation of is the system really working for who is using it now and then looking forward to the future. Um, you think about just so many different environments that you know in the in the um in the the building space here in the united states uh many of our old homes were painted with lead paint somebody said stop that because it was unsafe and so as we build new communities even though lead paint looks beautiful and it lasts forever we've moved on to something that's much more healthier and much more sustainable. When we think about systems, even the, we have to make sure we go through that process because when you just keep adding on to a broken system and that's this whole environment that we're in when people were talking about equity and economy, excuse me, equity and equality. I'm just gonna tell you those who have not been able to benefit for the benefit from the system if there's realization that the system is broken, broken, I guarantee you that those that are fighting for equity and equality don't want access, and I said don't want, don't want access to that broken system. And so how do we make sure that in this space of, of, of equity and getting outcomes that we're doing it in a way that we are destroying, deconstructing, rebuilding systems that are better off because that's going to be so important to figuring that out and how do you do that in a way from a global mindset is that you got to share khadijah mentioned with respect to doctors and and them sharing we have a number of amazing associations american hospital association uh physicians of uh, america all these groups that have just great minds that I'm hoping are stepping up to talk to their colleagues across the different uh, uh, time zones, especially in this world of COVID. I think every day I read about another symptom that is showing up. We were so sure in March and we're not sure here in July, but if it's not that continuous communication and that is from a professional perspective, but also from an individual perspective. And utilizing um, institutions like Augsburg and, how, and this type of setting to be able to share our learnings. Even though we're in this time of pause that we can't physically go where we need to go, there's no pause on knowledge sharing. There's no pause on picking up the good old fashioned telephone to connect, to be able to, be, to learn from each other. We have to do that because we, the world doesn't win if some corner of the earth finds the vaccine in the next five weeks and don't share the journey to there, don't share all of the learnings related to it, the world doesn't win. And, and that whole mindset of collaboration and that mindset of connecting and sharing our knowledge is going to be key. And I just think about a number of situations where in this, especially COVID space, that because we were in this pace of tension, you know, thinking, I, again, we are wanting not to get political, but thinking about the whole noise around the World Health Organization, that noise prevented constructive collaboration where we could have learned from what transpire to today and where we needed to communicate better. We don't have time for noise. People are dying. And so if we're not sharing our, our understanding and our experience and being honest and open about it, that collaboration, excuse me, that lack of collaboration is going to lead to a lot of communities that prior to March were chugging along just great 
to look like places of destruction. And we have to make sure that we're collaborating. I I'm so appreciate you bringing up the World Health Organization. You know, the uh, Director General, Dr. Tedros, was, um, I, was our lead speaker in support of our bid to host a World Expo here uh, coming up in a few years, and uh, has been an incredible friend. But he also was very, very involved as the health minister and then foreign minister of Ethiopia, connecting with the very, very large diaspora community from Ethiopia that's right here in Minnesota. And um, so the, the interconnectivity of the world um, is being disrupted by some people's view or attitudes or biases. Um, but I know that the, the good angels part of the hearts and minds and souls of people do shine. And I, uh, two weeks ago, um, uh, I was contacted at Global Minnesota by um, the Honorary Consul of South Africa, uh, Judge Lejun Lang, who was um, the chair of our Year of South Africa uh, just a couple years ago. And she had been uh, contacted by the Consul General of South Africa and the Ambassador from South Africa uh, to see if there were doctors in Minnesota who could back up the doctors in South Africa who were suddenly being absolutely overwhelmed, especially on technical matters relating to you know, all of the different procedures. And um, we were able to use uh, one of our uh, board members at Global Minnesota, Dr. Patricia Simmons, who was very close to the university and to Mayo, uh, to reach out to the head of the medical school, Dr. Toller, uh, at the university, who happens to be an immigrant from the Czech Republic, um, and to the leadership at Mayo with a new director of their international operations is from South Africa and to connect them now so that we have a backup going through the telemedicine and through you know, the digital format uh, from here in Minnesota to South Africa. And I'm sure that's happening in lots of other places around the world, but it is a leveraging of technology that is able to be done because we're leveraging relationships. And I wanna put a exclamation point about the way that both of you, uh, Khadija and Shantara, have devoted really significant amount of your lives to the relationship building and the deepening. And there are lots of um, questions popping up that have to do, I think, with people wanting to know how they best can talk with or speak with their friends or colleagues uh, who maybe are easily swept up with, uh, um, oh, there's a pandemic, close the gates. Oh, there's uh, racial injustice. Uh, there's nothing that can be done. How have you approached the relationship building and deepening, perhaps more uh, specifically with folks um, who maybe um, hadn't considered uh, a, be a global citizen or global mindedness, um, that our viewers today and those asking those questions um, could pick up some tips from you uh, in that regard. Um, well, that's actually a conversation we have been had, having locally, I believe, as well as globally since um, the ugly incident that took place with George Floyd's murder. Uh, racial injustice issues are happening everywhere across the globe, whether it's gender-based violence, whether it's economic, whether it's class, uh, whether it's race. Um, it's something that a lot of people in our world are experiencing in different levels. Uh, but I'll tell a little bit about living in Minnesota and being a, a Muslim American immigrant woman, uh, some of the experience that I have had and the conversations I've been having with my personal friends who are amazing people, highly intellectual, world traveler, learners, but yet somehow are afraid to have the conversation because they don't want to offend me. And 
what I always say to them is, don't, you cannot feel what you don't know. You have to ask me questions in order for me to educate you about my issues because we all make assumptions. We all read now these days we might get our news from social media, which doesn't really give you the full story or the narrative about an issue. So it's, I think, important that we take personal responsibility to engage our friends and to help them educate about who we are. And, and one thing um, I was talking to a good friend of mine recently said to me, well, now that our borders are closed, we don't have to receive more immigration. And I was kind of taken back because I thought personally, I made the assumption this was a highly educated, informed person who traveled the world. They'll have a little bit of different perspective than someone who might not have access to someone like me. So realizing that we all have a story, we, all, we are all important and we all are, um, are worth, you know, to be valued and respected. Our inputs and efforts and our, our actually help economies. One thing I always try to tell people is immigrants help economy, economies. Are, it gives us, right now in Minnesota, we have 19 Fortune 500 company. And I think, as Shantara said earlier, 40% of those companies, the biggest names in the world, are founded by immigrants, which gives not only Minnesota, but the United States the competitive edge, economy, you know, economic wise. Um, and, and I think we cannot shut certain groups out because of what we hear from the news or what we think. Um, you know, the impact will be if we are able to ask those questions. Um, you know, so ask question, don't be afraid. Ask any question because if, obviously, if they're offended, then, then, then it's a personal issue uh, that person has. But I think do not fear of asking questions because that's the only way for us to learn. I have learned a lot about the African-American culture um, in America because I've read the African-American history, I've read about slavery and civil rights movements and all the other things that have taken place. But to really understand the struggle, it took George Floyd's murder. I had to sit down with my African-American friends to really understand the, the social justice issues that are going on. Um, their struggles are a little bit different than mine because I came to this country with a little bit of different perspectives and different mindset. So I think we cannot judge books by its cover. We cannot judge someone uh, because based on how they look or even their past experience, it's really important that we take the time to understand one another. At the end of the day, we're all humans. We all want to have the same thing. We all have the same fears now. We're all afraid of this pandemic. We're all afraid of getting sick. We're all afraid of maybe not being able to get our jobs back. So we have more in common than difference. And I believe that if we really take the time to understand someone, we might leave there, maybe even falling in love with their culture or community or that person themselves. Amen. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think that I can um, just add any more substance. I just wanna lift up just Khadija's directive of just having the courage to have honest and authentic conversations. That that is just something that I believe is 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 core to this. You know, having the courage to do that. So I'll leave that there, and I'll just leave just one other statement related to what you said about Mark, the sentiment around um, uh, closing borders and 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 to to immigrants and. I have lifted, you know, the the business debt. I'm I'm just gonna be frank and just say, from a United States perspective, outside of our indigenous communities, we're all immigrants, and we came here either by force or fortune. The end. And so, if you choose to have a mindset that is different than that that's probably where you need to start with your courageous and authentic conversations, so. Amen. 
Well, there's been um, uh, several kind of specific questions, uh, people thinking about uh, wanting to take their skills overseas and looking for advice about applying for jobs and that kind of thing. Um, but there also was a, a, a kind of larger frame of that, which was um, how do you see the private sector models, the, 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 the ways that um, we have used uh, travel, tourism, trade, education, um, heritage uh, kind of perspective. There are a lot of things that are happening that bring us out into the world uh, and connect us. How do you see those evolving? And for Minnesotans who wanna be more directly engaged in those parts of the employment world, the private sector in that regard, uh, any advice for them about approaching that if they'd like to work overseas in Africa or in Europe and Asia, Latin America? Uh, specific advice is what I think a couple people are looking for. Hmm. <laughs> um, I think to, to what I said earlier is, is number one, start understanding your industry and how's your industry doing in the specific geography that you're looking to go through and so making sure that you do that homework i think what's really um, powerful about this moment that we're in right now with being able to find people um i remember talking to some um someone um that just works a lot with the number of high high-powered individuals here in the united states and he was saying like, I'm, I'm gonna just use this as an example and exaggerate because I wish that I could do this, but he was saying like, I just decided I wanted to like call Oprah and they were like, I just, you know, got to their people and like she was available tomorrow, like not like in a year. And so just people being like readily available right now. So I give that example to say, there's this opportunity just to connect, but then this opportunity that people are actually wanting a partner. And so where's, think about like, is there someone in that place that you want to do business in doing something similar? Where's, see it, see if you can partner and figure out um, how you can connect with them because people are just answering the phone and jumping on Zooms like the next day, like we're all at a standstill physically and so, no, as a former commissioner of employment economic de development, I don't want people to work 24 seven because that, that's not good for productivity, but people are like available and, and fitting a lot of stuff in their schedule and being present at places that they probably thought that they could, couldn't be at. And so see where you are. There's a number of amazing um, international conferences that are happening that amazing speakers are just there, that you are you can see them and ask questions and figure that out. I know a number of governments are having um, conferences to learn about how to continue to do business because every country, literally every country, is working on their strategic way forward to navigate the next normal and how they can continue to have um, a strong economy. And so as you're thinking about your pathway into um, the global business ecosystem. Think about partnership. Think about getting educated on what's happening and start that now and reach out to people to ask questions and similar in this space of personal growth and professional growth. Pick up the phone, ask questions. Great advice. Khadija. I, um, I, I think this pandemic has shown that work can be done anywhere. I mean, uh, Zoom allows us both to be small and large at the same time. And, and other also a lot of other great platforms that are out there that we utilize daily. And I know that uh, I've been in a lot of conversations with businesses, uh, they're inclined to rely local um, you know, local supply chain due to fear of disruption. But I do believe that um, this uh, pandemic also allows more inclusive uh, global business. So I believe you have a chance to really reinvent yourself, 
like Shantara said, pause, take a moment to reflect, and also do a market research. There are a lot of industries right now because of technology that work is shifting how we do business. There is doctors now in Minnesota can provide services in around the world with telehealth. So if you really look at maybe business as usual is shifting, and, and I believe uh, it's becoming more global, um, inclusive work environment because, because of technology, it's allowing us to really both, you know, be here and work anywhere else that you want in the world. But it's going to take a, bit of, a little bit of time because language and cultures and, and policies and governments, there's so many uh, different uh, contributors to the work. So making sure that you are taking the time to understand, taking the time to really uh, research, like Shantara just said, research and see what other opportunities are out there. But in our my business in particular, and obviously connections that we have and companies that we work with, we're seeing that they're hiring people around the world because of their skills. And I think there are a lot of barriers that were able to break because of the pandemic. Some of the qualifications might be different now than they used to. Um, for you to provide healthcare, in, even within the United States, we know that a lot of those have been, those uh, requirements have been, uh, uh, have been lifted. And, there, and that doctors can provide services around the country as well as around the world. Uh, as well as nursing, as well as a lot of other, um, also education, teachers. We might be able to, I was talking to schools that we work with, they might be able to hire diverse teachers because they're able to have this new way and this new platform. So there's so many opportunities. And I do believe um, if we are intentional and companies in particular and organizations that intentionally want to bring outside resource and more diverse into their not only economy but to their communities we have uh, opportunity to do that now i was uh, in a conversation with some people involved in mining uh in this case africa because africa has really a, almost all the world's uh reserves for the special metals and precious um minerals that are necessary for the green economy the solar economy the wind economy anyhow they were asking me about Minnesota companies and Minnesota people. Um, and they were sort of beating around the bush. And finally, one of them said, well, um, we have a partners in our mining, um, but our partners are really mostly interested in just the bottom line. We're looking for partners who are thinking about the environment, social issues, um, you know, a holistic view. Do Minnesota companies think like that? Is that in Minnesota's uh, wheelhouse? And that was, of course, like asking me, uh, you know, kind of the, the perfect question so I could then just get on my high horse and just talk about the historic role of Minnesotans and Minnesota people from, you know, being founders of the United Nations to all kinds of things. But more importantly, that we think of how we are in the world, not just the products, the things, the services, but how we do them. And we think about this larger question, not just because we're nicer people, but we have, we've struggled. You know, we've struggled over environment, over labor rights, over gender equity. This didn't just fall from the sky. But in that conversation, I realized that Minnesotans, Minnesota companies, Minnesota schools, universities, Minnesota professionals, Minnesotans can really put forth their values and many around the world who are hiring or looking for partners um, will resonate because we are proud of the fact that um, we think about and we strive to be uh, as inclusive and as holistic as we can be. At the same time, we are the center of the universe because uh, there was a police murder of an African-American man on the street. We, are, uh, we were the center in the nation of uh, eugenics back a hundred and some years ago. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, one of our most famous citizens, uh, Charles Lindbergh, was the, the leader of the America First movement uh, uh, up into the coming time of the Second World War. So 
in our state, we have, like all societies, all countries, all regions, different views, different perspectives. But Minnesotans have come down on the side of global mindedness and on struggling with the ways that we do that well and ways that we blow it. But the advice that both of you have provided about engaging in the conversation, don't be unwilling, use your courage part of your values to push you into the conversations and listening, but know that the world right at this moment is really ready for the conversation. And I'm thinking about uh, John Lewis's funeral and I'm thinking about uh, the values of patience and courage and standing up to power and being knocked down and knocked unconscious and nearly killed, all of those things. But I am also know that he lived long enough to be in this moment of global opportunity for conversations. And I, yeah, I just feel like there's a part of him out there somewhere that's saying, yeah, patience pays off, but you got to make hay when the sun shines. And so get on with it down there, everybody. It's your time. It's your opportunity. We've had a chance this morning to talk to each other, to get some questions from people from around the planet who are watching. But I also think that we've had an opportunity to remember that it's the inspiration so that the next day can be faced. The human condition is um, a lot of difficulty no matter what, but it also is uh, the love and joy of the natural world and of the human body and of the love that occurs. And so here we are, Minnesota was ground zero in the globalization of a conversation. And the question I hear from the world, and I hope this morning, and with our viewers' help, uh, this has been, I think, accomplished. The world wants to know what we're going to do with our new awareness and this somewhat opening uh, in the global opportunity. Um, I'm hoping that this will um, be part of the forums ongoing conversation at Augsburg. Uh, it's so uh, exciting to be part of that bigger conversation. Um, but I do hope that all of us folks that are watching and organizers and uh, Shantara and Khadija, the whole um, community here is struggling to see how to best take this opportunity and keeping in mind those children of ours and those grandparents of ours and that whole business of wanting to make sure we are viewed someday as the good ancestors. I'm so grateful for this morning's conversation and I hope we can do this again and again and that we keep listening. Last words from Shantara Khadija. Wow. Thank you, thank you for that recap, Mark. That was that was really powerful. Just a couple things that I wanted to just lift up first, just to thank um, the team at Osberg for this opportunity, and thank everyone from around the world to see the value in spending their time with us to have a conversation about um, global citizenship. For for me, it's it's just continue. This is one of the things that you shouldn't stop. And if you haven't started having these conversations, start having these conversations, continue. Someone very wise, either about climate um, or religion said, if you're going through hell, keep going, <laughs> get through it. And that's how some of those conversations are gonna feel. They're gonna be hot, they're gonna be heavy. But the, the core of what I am learning and, and, and for me, every day is an opportunity to learn and be better and to do better is to have the core of humanity at my conversations whenever i'm able to be a voice of reasoning and a voice of learning to someone whatever your bottom line is people planet or profits 
humanity should be core to the outcome and making sure you're doing it in a way to make people better off. And so all the conversations that I hope that you all leave here having, make sure you leave somebody better off, either with a piece of your narrative, a piece of your history, a piece of just the vision that you have for, as what Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community. We haven't made it to that yet. It's still a vision, it's still a dream, and we can do our part to make it real. And so I look forward to, um, in my corner of the world, continuing my work, and I just hope to hear about and actually get the opportunity, because we're gonna get past this, we're gonna get through it, to see the work that you all do in your neighborhoods to make sure that we all have a better world. So, so thank you all. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Shantara. Thank you to the whole team of Export for really bringing this conversation into the forefront. I really want to appreciate and thank all the participants who join us today. Um, you know, we're all struggling to manage, you know, the same healthcare issues, fighting injustices in our world, whether it's by racial injustice, equity injustice, gender injustice, or education injustice, or something else. But we can we came together and um, and and I think as a human spirit, uh, I get to see. The, the strength and the resilience, you know, being always in between two different cultures and community and languages, I get to see the human spirit coming together, whether it's in East Africa or, you know, my corner in Minnesota. Um, and I believe we are so much more stronger when we come together. And um, our new normal might be different, but we are, we are much more connected uh, than before. And I, and, um, and we should celebrate that. Um, although physically we might be separated, I believe that because of the platforms we have access to, we were able to not only have this type of conversations, but we're able to connect even friends that and family maybe we have not connected in a while. So I do believe that we should celebrate our connectivity and our local communities as well as our global ones. Um, I'm hopeful, I'm an optimist, and I know that this is a difficult time for a lot and our boats might be different and our access to resource, but I do believe that if we continue, someone, I was reading an article that said, this pandemic has done something that for globalization that has never been done before. All the efforts and, and we have done in the, in, the, in the best decades have not done what this pandemic has done for globalization. And I hope we continue to recognize that and we hope, I hope that we continue to recognize the efforts of those who are front, frontline workers and, and we appreciate that someone, and, and for me it's a bit personal, I actually contracted COVID and for me I have a deep gratitude and appreciation for the frontline workers. I get to really experience their work and, and, and I cannot, they are the epitome of global citizens, I believe. Um, so I really hope that we continue with these conversations, we continue with these connections, and then we continue to ask hard questions. And like Shantara said earlier, the thing is with uh, policies, it was designed by people and they can be breaking and, and we can put new policies that work for all and, and, and bring more chess world into our, into our global world. So I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to connect with all of you. And I'm looking forward to a better tomorrow. Thank Amen. you all. Over to you, Steve. Yeah, absolutely. A huge thank you to Mark, Shantara, and Khadija. Oh, guys, can you think what we were talking about last winter when we first started planning this pr uh, presentation and then where we are today? Um, what a completely different conversation we are having now. Um, which probably to some several of your points underscores just how deeply the conversation needed to be then, but how much more deep we're having it now because of the challenges we're all facing. Um, you know, there was a comment very early in in the chat that said, should we call it a quadruple threat instead of the triple threat that I talked about to add the collapse of democracy into this equation? So let's just say this. I mean, as we all strive to be better, better citizens of our countries, we also need 
to be better citizens of our world and realize that um, some of these systems are, that are good, needing, of course, a great deal of improvement perhaps, but some of these systems that, are, that have supported our current situ situation in the world are under threat as well. And we need to make sure we uphold things like our democracy so that we have a voice uh, in these conversations. So a huge thank you to all of you. Um, um, I guess to the housekeeping part of it, this is the last of our, our current Diversity Insights presentations. So I hope you will also join us for our ongoing webinar and podcast series. You can find about more about those on our, on, our, on our website. Our next webinar actually is scheduled for August 27th. We'll have Jeff, Jeffrey Cookson and Shauna Ramchandani from Language and Cultures Worldwide at joining, joined by Aisha Gori Ozaki from Allstate Insurance. And they'll be talking about facing the reality Partnering with business to execute DNI priorities. Several of your questions actually raised that, uh, and they will be talking about those things. Um, also, I want to call out, and by the way, uh, to Mark and Chantara and Khadija talking about continuing the conversation. The call for proposals for the forum's conf conference year, which will begin probably in October, and certainly for our big international conference in March, um, is open. That call is open, and we really encourage any of you to. Um, send in a proposal. The theme this year is workplace revolution, kind of what we've been talking about, from talk to collective action with four learning pillars, dismantling systemic racism, reinvention during disruption, people as assets, and allies for equity. So we would certainly encourage folks uh, to propose for that. It is still open. We'll take pre uh, proposals next week as well, uh, or as they come up to you, certainly contact me. I'm happy to talk you about uh, presentation at uh, any of the forum events uh, for this next year. Uh, a final note, um, today's Diversity Insights presentation is SHRM and HRCI eligible. The activity codes are in the chat. And for SHRM, it's 20-Z as in Zebra, E as in Edward, S as in Sam, U as in University, J as in Jack. And for HRCI, the code is 52 nine seven eight eight um, as I said they're in the chat uh, if you need an actual certificate it'll be available upon request and that's it for us today thanks for joining us everyone we hope you have a great uh, rest of your morning or afternoon depending on where in the world you are or evening um, thanks again to Mark Frontera and Khadija and to the farm staff who had lots of tech challenges today but pulled it off brilliantly as they usually do we'll see you at our next webinar or forum event. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.